Schiaparelli is one of, if not the, most interesting brands to watch today. From incredible craftsmanship to incredibly beautiful clothes, they are the ones to watch from each couture season. But it wasn't always an easy path to get there. It actually seems that Elsa Schiaparelli, the namesake, wanted to go into business well before she was able to. On the compliments of Paul Poiret, the leading couturier at the time who eventually became her mentor, she wanted to begin producing clothing for sale in the early 1920s, but in order to do so, she needed investors. This was a time before women could own their own bank accounts, so this conclusively was fundamental. She began making designs while interning at Paul Poiret, the first of which for a lady named Gabby Buffet Picabia, who was one of the major figures behind the Dada art movement. So soon, with a portfolio of work in hand, she visited several potential investors, but unfortunately, she ultimately failed at getting an investment. And yet, she didn't give up. She began instead looking for her first producible garment and found it in a woman that came to visit her wearing a lumpy jumper, something Schiaparelli in her autobiography called Steady. You see, this was the day of Chanel's heyday and she was mass-producing these perfect little jumpers that looked machine-knit, i.e. they had no faults. Meanwhile, this jumper was thoroughly imperfect and very solid in its structure due to the fact that it was double-stitched, which means that there were two yarns used in the knit rather than one. She adored it. She immediately asked the lady where it was made and was pointed in the direction of an Armenian woman who had hand-knit the jumper named Arusiag Mikelian. Inspired by this steady jumper, she went to visit Arusiag with her own design, a plain v-neck jumper with three-quarter length sleeves and a bow at the front in a trompe l'oeil style. Something totally unique for the time, but very on trend with the Dada art movement that was both making waves and that she had been introduced to through Gabe Buffet Picabia. So, Scaparelli, without really a business, set out to promote this new jumper. Luckily, she was a lady who moved in high society because of her wealthy upbringing, which, though she hated, still put her in rubbed shoulders with the right people. She wore her jumper to dinner for promotion and blew the minds of all the women there, including a buyer from Abraham and Strauss in New York who would go on to be Schiaparelli's first sockist, ordering 40 jumpers and 40, yet undesigned, skirts. She could design the skirts, but there was a bigger issue. She'd promised these 80 garments to be delivered within two weeks, which was an enormous task considering she had no manufacturing facilities bar the one Armenian woman. Incredibly, somehow these two women did make it happen though after hiring several other Armenian women throughout the city that could come and help knit all of the pieces, even if they were a week late on delivery. These women would go on to be Elsa's first workforce, and loved by her dearly. They soon followed with accessories like scarves, handkerchiefs, and men's ties throughout the years 1923 to about 1926, in which her business seemingly grew really quickly and had outgrown her home, which is where her and her team had been working. It was time to expand. By May 1927, Schiaparelli would make her first actual collection of garments, inclusive of those jumpers, but now expanded to include jackets, jumpers, and skirts adorned with her infamous stylized buttons made from Jean Clément that were a major hit with women and soon got Elsa some very interested and very needed investors. Though she likely had several offers, it was Charles Kahn who ultimately won the bid of partnership in 1927 something undoubtedly fortuitous as he was affiliated with the Galerie Lafayette, the biggest and best store in all of Paris. Not only was he, being a man, able to own the accounts for the company, meaning that Scaparelli could officially be set up as a business, but he was also very well connected and so was the perfect partner to expand the brand. And they did so quickly. By the same month, December, her designs were in an issue of Beau, with them calling it an artistic masterpiece, being featured many times in the following year too. By August 1928, the New Yorker said Scaparelli was the owner of Knit, 
She was selling in numerous countries, but most notably in America, where the majority of her sales came from, and her designs began to be copied left, right, and center, something she never actually minded and found very flattering, but still raised her prices significantly for those that she didn't trust or were overseas as a way to make back that loss. In this time, she also released her first perfume in 1929, which, though I believe it was a licensed product, ensured revenue as high as possible. So, the Scaparelli brand was born, and successful on the ideas of Trompe l'oeil and Knit, but very soon other codes for the house would see her reach international fame. There were two in particular that came to define the brand. One was surrealism, or in general avant-garde designs, which was obviously an extension of the early Dada influence in the Trompe l'oeil, and the other was practicality. For the surrealism aspect, it was not simply a collaboration. She had been friends with Man Ray for years, even prior to the company starting, thanks to Gabby buffet picapia who was Man Ray's closest friend and Elsa's first client. And through him, she would soon meet several other artists, like Salvador Dali, with whom she had a long working relationship. She even personally considered her clothes to be sculpture. While practicality was pretty much how she built her business. With her controversial designs to draw in attention, it was really pieces like her two-piece day suit that were the backbone of the company. She very well balanced the line between practicality and interest. She designed a weekend outfit specifically meant to be comfortable in the newfangled cars, a speakeasy dress that could conceal a flask as a tribute to prohibition. She caused a stir when she put women in trousers, despite not being the first to do it gloves that you could strike a match on for ease of smoking, and also many, many garments that were reversible or transformable so could be worn in multiple ways, often from day to evening. She was also a huge innovator in the textile space, inventing fabrics that looked or behaved like other materials like wood bark or even glass, all of which connected through her signature silhouette of square shoulders, straight skirts, short jackets, and stiff silks and suits for every moment of the day all of which came together to secure the Scaparelli company as fashion's foremost creative couturier. She was coming to a point where even Elsa herself was as famous as her fashion brand. But so far, nearly all of her operations were run out of her new studio in the attic of Quatre Rue de Rappé, which was becoming obviously far too small for her and her 400 employees. At least, that was until 1935, the same year she literally invented the idea of a themed collection, when she would inherit a 98-room space at Van de A Place Vendôme, the perfect place for the foot traffic she planned to invite. The place was a revolution. Of course, she had the first floor, second floor to the American English speakers, with the necessary showrooms that were standard at the time for measuring, fitting, and entertaining guests, but it was actually the ground floor that was the true sensation. Here, for the first time ever, a client would be able to walk into a couture studio and pick up knits, lingerie, swimsuits, dressing gowns, hats, belts, scarves, handbags, and jewelry, all of Demi Couture. Meaning for the first time ever, a client could walk into a couture house and leave the same day with a piece. In short, she claimed to have invented the boutique. It was a revelation, but a lot of people in the industry did not like it. Not that they had much of a choice in the matter, Elsa was headstrong, the customers were buying, and her fame grew to be as big as Chanel's with her income reflecting that. She opened offices in New York and in London with financing from James and Henry Spence Horn, who would also help her create her own perfume line in 1934 named Parfum Scaparelli, which meant that her perfumes were no longer licensed. Her client list grew to include major celebrities at the time like Wallace Simpson, Marlena Dietrich and Catherine Hepburn, and she even started working on costuming for movies. Despite the Great Depression of the 30s, it seemed Scaparelli could do no wrong having hit after hit collection, with standouts being her numerous designs in collaboration with her friend and artist Salvador Dali, the newspaper print in 1935, the Zodiac collections between 1937 and 1938, and most importantly, the invention of Shocking Pink in 1937, which came along with a perfume of the same name that was an absolutely enormous success, and so became both her signature scent and colour. 
This was so successful, in fact, that by the same year, 1937, Schiaparelli and her business partner, Henry Horn, had managed to buy all three branches of Parfum Schiaparelli in London, America, and Paris outright. But war was right around the corner, and despite her best attempts, her business was hit hard. Elsa, who had particular willingness to hire immigrants, lost a significant number of her employees as they were called back to their own countries, down from a minimum 600 to only 150 who chose to remain working, likely because their families were from Paris or they simply had nowhere else to go. She continued to design in this time, specifically things that would help women if they found themselves in a difficult situation. She made one dress that was supposedly meant to protect against harmful gases, and another that was covered in pockets to allow people to stuff them while keeping their hands free if they had to run. But despite her reluctance to leave, by around 1940, Scaparelli was out of the country, and a designer named Irene Dana agreed to take charge and managed it until the end of the war. Unlike many, we know now Scaparelli was not a collaborator with the Nazis and even ran Buviaks for the weary. But at the time, she had to pretend to be very neutral in order to keep her business going. This grew suspicions from both sides, so meant that she was very unlikely to be able to stay in business with England, America and Germany suspecting her of being a spy. So it was to everyone's surprise, and thereby suspicion, that the company successfully kept in business all the way through the war. This was primarily because, though the London branch of her perfume was now defunct because of complications with Henry, she now owned the whole of Parfum Scaparelli because of it. This ultimately was the saving grace, as her financial stability in the war was fed mostly by perfumes and American couture clients. Saying that, even the fact that she stayed in business is a real testament to how well-loved she was as a designer, that despite her political activism, even as an Italian herself speaking out publicly against Mussolini, which eventually had put a target on her back both from the Americans, British, Germans and Italians, was incredible. So incredible, in fact, that after the war, she was questioned to ensure that she was not secretly sleeping with the enemy. She was not. As the war ended, she returned to a post-war Paris. Here, she not only found her business still remained, but in fact more popular than ever with a line of GIs outside the shop waiting to buy hats and perfumes for their mothers and partners. She credited this success to her workers that stayed, and specifically to Irene Dana, who had served Scaparelli and co. so well. She'd kept the doors open, kept the staff employed through some hard times, and kept the name of Scaparelli alive. But she turned out to be a less imaginative designer than her patron, which ultimately was rather fortunate, as Scaparelli would have hated being outdone. However, after the war was a tricky time for fashion. Despite Scaparelli's personal fame continuing to be enormous, Scaparelli, having always been in tune with what women wanted, both practically and aesthetically, found it hard to keep up with the times and was slowly being replaced by new couturiers like Jacques Fath. She didn't seem to understand how the new look from Dior had taken off quite so strongly, leaving her and other designers in the dust. Which in fairness does make historical cultural sense considering Dior's new look was very well lauded in the media at the time but wasn't necessarily well received by the public. With this book, The Anti-Capitalist Book of Fashion, even suggesting that people were protesting the look, and I saw on TikTok recently somebody threw paint over the look too. So it makes sense why she didn't quite understand why the look took off so well, but regardless, she still had to react to it. So the brand began trying different designers and creative directors, first with Pierre Cardin in 1945 and then with Hubert de Givenchy in 1947. Though neither lasted for very long and the couture side of the company was in fact losing money most years, she worked tirelessly to keep her reputation intact. But actually, she hadn't designed for the company for several years and instead used freelance sketch artists. She was also far too free with her finances and was criticised, in a friendly way, by Givenchy for it. In fact, he'd even tried to help her get her spending under control. 
Though in fairness, that's not to say the company wasn't still profitable. They had branches in Canada, London, Paris and America. A junior mist line, of course the perfumes that were still money makers, even opening their own perfume factory in France in 1947. And by 1953, she had 11 different licensing agreements, most if not all of which were profitable, even if Scaparelli's personal wealth had for a while dried up. However, the problem with the company wasn't so much lack of profits, it's just that eventually it seemed like Schiaparelli personally had kind of given up. And eventually she took the decision to close the gilded doors in 1954. So for now, the business fully closed, save for the perfumes, was bound to be lost to history. The perfume side was sold in 1979 and then again in 1997, although by then it was already a shell of what it once was, thanks mostly to the original ingredients no longer being available. That was until the 1990s, when something in fashion began to change. Fashion had become slowly more accessed by the public, thanks to an uptake in general public interest, but also a lot thanks to the internet. This brings us to something that is brought up in this book about her designs. Quote, Who cared how the garment was constructed? The effect from a distance was what counted. Though by today's standards, her clothes were impeccably made, and in fact, this quote is said about her early designs, so is not reflective of most of her work, her designs always retained an immediate visual impact that was perfect both for the books being written on fashion and the internet. Because of this, Scaparelli as a designer grew a whole new audience of people that were researching the greatest designers of the past, which meant that the brand began to have a lot of value once more. The demand for a revival of the Scaparelli brand was the single most discussed in fashion circles at that time coming into the 2000s, thanks to the rise in fashion books that highlighted her work. These books were mine. This whole concept is called a sleeping beauty, which is when a brand has substantial value but the public doesn't necessarily remember the exact codes of the house and so the marketing team can effectively reinvent the brand, picking and choosing elements of the previous designer's work to remind the public of. Scaparelli was in an interesting place though, because the people that were asking for a revival remembered her for her surrealist influence more than anything while several of the other codes, like her practicality, weren't necessarily remembered. This brings us to 2006, when the brand was finally purchased for revival by Diego Della Valle, chairman of Todd's, that recently had seen a successful revival with Roger Vivier. Smartly though, he knew the value of the brand and its history, and sat on it for a full six years, waiting for the Van de Aan plus Van Dom address to once again be free, so that he could buy it. Shortly following the location purchase, an exhibition at the Met named Scaparelli and Prada Impossible Conversations was unveiled and was used as promotion for Della Valle to announce the relaunch, which would happen at Van der Arme Place Van Damme. The location, as discussed, is iconic to the brand and really important to the history. Having this location adds back that history to give an authenticity that allows the newly interested consumers, thanks to the Met Show, to see that real effort had been put into the revival. It was here that the house, during the week of Haute Couture in July, would reveal their first collection. Couture Autumn Winter 13. Interestingly, this collection was designed without a creative director and instead by Christian Lacroix. This was a mistake from a branding perspective, as it begins the company on an unsure foot. It's great to use a famous designer for promotion, but not if they knowingly would leave immediately afterwards. The themes that the public need to be confirmed from the historic house in order for it to be a successful Sleeping Beauty revival simply cannot be the same, or at the very least easily identifiable between this collection and the following collection, which was designed by the house's first creative director, Marco Zanini. To be totally honest, I think this was because John Galliano had been heavily rumoured to take over. His theatricality would have lended to the house certainly, but this actually came only a year after his anti-Semitic rant so, I believe they were just kind of waiting to see if public perception changed so that they could bring him on board to revive the company. 
which of course public perception did not change and so another creative director had to be found. But like I said, that is truly just speculation. As it happened, Lacroix and Zanini did in fact produce two wildly different collections and it was a rocky start because of it. Despite what enthusiasts wanted, Zanini's offering was rather diet scaparelli in comparison to the Lacroix offering, and so he was almost set up to fail. What's sadder though is that despite it not really being his fault, he even kind of apologised for it in this interview with Vogue coming into his second collection, Autumn Winter 14 Couture. This collection was far more wacky, something the audience wanted, sure, but frankly, it was rather ugly, and I doubt they had many sales from this collection whatsoever. So, between his first bland and his second ugly collection, it was clear Zanini wasn't right for Scaparelli. He was replaced quickly by Bertrand Guillaume. Starting spring 2015, Bertrand too didn't really have the pizzazz needed to bring back Scaparelli to its former glory. But over his time at the brand, he introduced the most ideas. They had a demi couture collection in autumn winter 16 that consisted mostly of daywear, something the brand hadn't really done since Elsa's time heading the brand. But importantly, he reintroduced bags to the brand and interestingly, the face motif as well. Unfortunately, the Demi Couture collection was quite off-brand. A little plain, none of the inventiveness of Elsa was brought through, and none of the utilitarianism either. But, like I said, this was a sleeping beauty, and they were trying to reimagine the codes, so it wasn't as off-brand to the public then as it is if you know the brand history and Elsa's personal history too. But, contrastingly, they also started an initiative called Story in spring 2019 and pre-fall 2019, where the brand was supposed to invite in artists or artist collectives to design clothing. A brilliant idea. Elsa thought her dress is a sculpture and even used this exact idea as part of her own marketing back in the day, so it would be excellent PR and very on-brand even if the dresses were as unwearable as Elsa's aforementioned glass dress. As it manifested though, Clearly, management had them under strict orders that it must be commercial, as it was listed as ready-to-wear, and the public was dealt rather bland collaborations as seen here, which is just a real shame. He was replaced by spring 2019 after less than four years. Now enters Daniel Rosebury, who debuted in fall 2019, where during his show he produced sketches of each look in just the time the models walked. He used her famous trompe l'oeil motifs, as well as a penchant for adaptable clothing in a velcro dress, her love for animalistic elements, surrealist elements, and even the utilitarian elements from her work during the war. Clearly, this collection was a love letter to a woman he was extremely well read on. A great debut. By spring 2020, he had hit a serious stride and seemed to include even more Scaparelli references, with the most notable being the heavy use of gold. Elsa herself frequently used gold, she had a jewellery line and had many friends that wore jewellery like Iris Apfel does today, and even had an uncle that was a famous Egyptologist. So gold was personal to her as well as a recurring theme. But by bringing it back in this way while reflecting her ethos felt so fresh, new and unique to Daniel. And now because his sister Liz Fox Roseberry has a jewellery brand, it in hindsight feels very authentic. There are countless references to her previous work in Daniel Scaparelli, like the glasses and the backstar embroidery, which still today is done by Lassange, who did her original embroideries all the way back in the 1920s and 30s, but really, it was the jewellery that set his career in Scaparelli in stone. His design is phenomenal, sure, but couture clothing is not necessarily profitable, so having something like jewellery, especially costume jewellery, which has an enormous markup, can be the backbone of a company like this, as it can really fund the couture collections. Both of these two things came hand in hand when Lady Gaga wore a bulletproof dress by Scaparelli with an enormous gold bird pin to Joe Biden's inauguration. This kind of PR for a company that is still small, like Scaparelli was, is invaluable and brought attention both to the clothing offering and to the jewellery. From here, it was a sharp upturn in promotion and awareness for the company, interestingly paralleling Elsa's own journey. She rose through the Great Depression, and Roseberry rose within the pandemic, with each season being more and more anticipated than the last. 
By spring summer 21, the brand was able to show a full ready to wear collection, which also included known cash cows like sunglasses and bags, obviously as a push to add another financial security to the company. The collection, also designed by Daniel Rosebery, very well crosses the line between creative and commercial, while not seeming like too much of a watered down version of the couture. In fact, giving the consumer directly what they wanted, quickly making a hit bag with his first ready to wear iteration for the company. The introduction of this with accessories throughout the years will slowly but surely turn the company into something that is seriously, genuinely financially viable. This also allowed them more budget for celebrity endorsement, which has now become a staple part of the PR strategy, with people like Doja Cat being covered in those red crystals and Kylie Jenner having the large lion head dress, both for the Spring Summer 23 Couture, and then later with Michaela Cole and Jordan Roth at the Met Gala. But it was in fact this Spring Summer 23 Couture that had the most amount of media attention to date, with people debating whether it was cruel to show fake animals beheaded or not as some said it was glorifying trophy hunting. I'll let you decide your opinion on that, but it does very well fit with the codes of the Scaparelli brand, with their trompe l'oeil and pension for animal-based design elements. So even if it did cause some controversy, it was very on-brand controversy. Actually, even controversy itself could be considered on-brand for Scaparelli, considering how much of a knack for it Elsa had. Of course, all of which feeds into the amount of anticipation coming into the recent Autumn Winter 23 Couture Collection. This collection literally just showed, and was again incredibly on brand for the Scaparelli company. And even without controversy in this collection, it is clear that the brand is on a massive upwards trajectory from here. In my opinion, now that we have the ready-to-wear made and more profitable areas of product like the jewellery, I'd like to see a few more cash cows added to the company and perhaps an entry point product just to secure their financial positioning. Specifically, I think a perfume would be perfect to capitalise on the iconic perfumes of the original brand, especially with the uptake in perfume TikTok, like this video from Erin Parsons, who is very interesting for her antique perfumes. But also, I think that in the future, when maximalist makeup comes back into fashion, they're very well poised to be the brand to spearhead that trend. I also think, when they can afford it, bringing back the Story Collective would be great. A bit like how Loewe did their craft exhibition, Scaparelli could easily do that with clothing. Specifically, I think an exhibition collection with Daniel Lismore or even Grayson Perry would be really interesting. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be couture because it would be sculpture. So it may even be relatively affordable and then they would perhaps even be able to sell tickets in order to make a real profit. I suppose this is all a way to say that the Scaparelli brand has an enormous history from which they can pick from. And really, we have only brushed the surface of the company despite how long this video is. But they have such an amazing potential because of it. Hence why it was such a strong sleeping beauty for so many years. I have already started on a life and death of Elsa, which if you did enjoy my Karl Lagerfeld life and death documentary, then you need to subscribe for that because it is already so interesting. There's also my beauty channel to subscribe to and my Patreon if you'd like early access to future videos there, like the life and death of Elsa Scaparelli, which will hopefully be up sooner rather than later. <laughs>